Today, we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please gently pull up behind the like button at a red light and the instant it turns green, immediately lay on your horn to speed the like button up. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's stories. At 7.20 p.m. on Friday, January 12th, 2007, 19-year-old college freshman Wade Steffi walked into Ford Dining Hall, which is one of five dining halls on Purdue University's campus. Purdue is a prestigious American university located in Indiana that is known for its excellent athletics and academics. Wade, who was an aviation technology student and was at Purdue on a full academic scholarship, grabbed some food and then sat down at a table with some friends. This was the first Friday of the 2007 spring semester, and so Wade and his friends at the table and the hundreds of other students that were sitting all around them were buzzing with excitement about what they were up to that night and what they were up to that weekend. And so Wade and his friends, they sat there chatting about their plans for about an hour. And then at around 8.20 p.m., Wade realized he needed to leave. And so he stood up, he said goodbye to his friends, he carried his tray to the trash can, and then he made his way out of the doors he came in on. And so once he was outside of the dining hall, he immediately turned right and walked the very short distance to the building that was right next to Ford Dining Hall. And so that building was called Owen Hall, and it was a dormitory. Now, this was not Wade's dormitory. He actually lived in a different dorm called Kerry Quad West, which was located on the other side of Ford Dining Hall. And so Wade goes inside of Owen Hall because he has some friends in there, and he makes his way to their room, and when he goes inside, he sees they're all kind of sitting around chatting and drinking some alcoholic drinks. And so Wade sits down, and he has a couple of drinks and he just hangs out with his friends for about an hour. And so around 9.30 p.m., Wade and the other people he was with in this room, they left Owen Hall and they walked the half mile away from campus to the west to this huge party at a fraternity. And so Wade would stay at this fraternity for several hours until about midnight, at which point he pulled one of his friends aside and he told them that he just remembered he had left his jacket inside of Owen Hall and so he wanted to go back and retrieve it. The dorms on Purdue's campus all lock at night, and so the only way you can get inside is if you live there and so you have a key, or if you know someone who lives there who will open the door for you. And so during his walk back to Owen Hall, Wade would make six phone calls in an attempt to get someone in Owen Hall to open the door for him but four of his phone calls would just be the wrong number. And so the people that were picking up and he was asking to open the door, they didn't know what he was talking about, and so they hung up. But he did call two people that did live inside of Owen Hall. However, they didn't answer their phones. And so around 12.30 a.m., Wade arrived at Owen Hall. He put his phone back in his pocket, and he just walked up to the doors, which were locked, and he just started knocking. And eventually, a resident of Owen Hall who didn't know Wade, and Wade didn't of them, they heard the knocking and they came out to the door to see what was going on and they looked through the glass and they saw Wade and apparently they decided that Wade looked too intoxicated to let into the building and so they refused him entry. And so Wade apparently stood there, he kept knocking for a little bit, but he eventually just kind of gave up, he turned around and he walked away. Fast forward a few days to Tuesday, January 16th, and Wade's roommate, who had actually been gone all the past weekend, he returned, and the first thing he noticed when he got back to his dorm was that Wade was not in the dorm. And so he called and texted Wade, but he didn't get a response. And so the roommate went out around the floor that they lived on to ask people if they had seen Wade, and no one had seen him since the previous Friday. And so starting to get pretty concerned, the roommate called Wade's family to see if maybe they knew what was going on with him. 
but his family had no idea. And so by the end of that day, the police had been contacted about Wade potentially being missing, and they in turn contacted Wade's cell phone provider, and they were able to determine that Wade's cell phone was still showing up somewhere on Purdue's campus, although they couldn't figure out exactly where. So that evening, a massive campus-wide search was launched with hundreds of police officers and volunteers. Even the school's equestrian club came out with their horses to search the nearby woods. But despite this huge search effort that would go on for several weeks, the only thing they would find of Wade's was one of his shoes. It was found on January 20th, so just four days into the search, and it was located right outside of an exterior door that led into a maintenance room inside of Owen Hall. But when they searched this maintenance room, Wade wasn't in there. Finally, after nearly a month of searching, when they still had not found Wade, the official search was called off. On March 19th, roughly two months after Wade had been reported missing, a maintenance worker was downstairs in the laundry room of Owen Hall when they heard a strange popping sound. At first, the worker thought it was actually coming from one of the washers or dryers that was on, and you know, maybe there's a loose coin or some piece of metal that was inside of the washer or dryer that's getting banged around inside and that's making the sound. And so this worker began walking around the laundry room, kind of listening listening in to each of the washers and dryers that were on to see if they were making this sound. And so as he's doing this, he hears the popping sound again, but it's clearly not coming from any of the washers and dryers. In fact, it's not even coming from inside the laundry room. It's coming from somewhere out in the hall. Curious, he leaves the laundry room and he goes out into the hall, and as soon as he's standing in the hall, he hears the popping sound again. And this time, it was obvious that it was coming from behind the closed door that was directly opposite the laundry room. So the worker pulled out his big set of keys, he opened the door that was directly in front of him, and he stepped inside. Moments later, he would make a big discovery. Based on that discovery and the investigation that would follow it, this is a reconstruction of what happened to Wade Steffi. In the early morning hours of January 13th, right after Wade had been denied entry into Owen Hall because the student who was in there who didn't know him thought he was too intoxicated, right after that happened, Wade left the front doors and made his way around to the left side of the building to look for another way inside. And when he got to the left side of the building, he found another door. Now, even though this door did not have a sign on it that said, keep out, it was fairly obvious that this door was not designed for students to use. There was a metal railing that lined the outside of this door, clearly to prevent pedestrians from getting to the door, and the door itself was actually not built at ground level. It basically was built at basement level, so you'd be standing at this railing looking down at the door, and down in front of the door was a slab of cement right out in front of it that gave the door enough clearance to be able to open. And so basically there was a railing around a pit and that was where the door was. The proper way to get to this door was to literally climb over that railing and jump down into this pit. And then you'd need a key to open this door because it was always locked. Well, it was supposed to always be locked. And so when Wade saw this clearly off-limits door on the side of Owen Hall, in his drunken state, he decided it would be a good idea to try to go into it. Because in his mind, he thought, you know, whatever is behind this door doesn't really matter. As long as I can just get inside of some part of Owen Hall, I can find my way up to my friend's room and I can get my jacket. And so he rushes over to the railing, he climbs over, he leaps down into that pit area, he grabs the doorknob of this off-limits door and he pulls on it and it's open. So he opens it up, he steps inside, and it's totally pitch black. And all he can hear is the sound of machines humming and whirring in the darkness. And again, in his drunken state, he decides this is still a good idea. His only concern was he couldn't find a light switch, and it really was basically pitch black in here. And he was worried once the door shut, not only would his only light source be totally cut off, but it might actually lock behind him, and then he'd be trapped inside of this room. 
And so he took off one of his shoes and he tucked it in the door jam of the door he came in on to keep it open. And so with the door propped open behind him, he began walking into this room. And pretty much right away, he bumped into this big metal structure. He couldn't see what it was because again, it was too dark, but he could feel it and he could tell, you know, it was a flat metal structure. It felt like a machine of some kind. And he could hear that it was one of the machines that was buzzing and whirring. And so he just decided he would try to walk around it. Because again, his goal is just to get through this room and find another door somewhere and kind of continue his journey up into the dorm. And so Wade began moving his way left along this machine, kind of believing it was gonna come to a stop at some point, and then he could walk around it. But it would turn out this machine was very big, very wide. And so by the time he actually got to the left edge of this machine, he was practically right up against the wall of the room he was in. And when he got there, he realized the space between the side of the machine and the wall of the room was big enough that if he turned sideways, he could basically squeeze his way past it. Now, he had no idea how far into the room this strange machine went, but in his drunken state, he decided it was a good idea. And so he turns sideways, so his back is to the wall of the room, and his chest is going to be facing the machine, and he begins pushing himself into that narrow space. And so as he's making his way, his hands are up, kind of protecting his face and neck, and at some point, he kind of begins to trip. Now, he didn't actually fall because he's basically wedged into this tight space, but for a second, he reflexively grabbed with his hands onto this machine right in front of him, and just by chance, his left ring finger slipped into a very narrow hole that was about two inches deep. The room that Wade was inside of was called an electrical vault, and it contained six large transformers, one of which Wade's finger had just stuck inside of. The job of these six transformers is to take the high voltage they receive from the main power grid and then transform it, hence the name, into lower usable voltage that gets dispersed into Owen Hall for residents and teachers. Even though the outside of these transformers had mostly been covered with protective materials that mitigated the electrocution risk, there were still several parts of these machines that there was just nothing you could do. They just presented a really high electrocution risk. And one of those sections you needed to be extra careful with was that two inch hole that Wade's finger slipped inside of. At the back of that hole was an exposed electrical conductor. And the second the tip of his finger touched that conductor, between 2,000 and 4,000 volts of electricity were pumped into his body. For reference, when people get executed via the electric chair, they are electrocuted with 2,000 volts of electricity. Wade likely died instantly but because of the fact that he was kind of wedged between the transformer and the wall, after he died, he didn't just slump onto the ground. Instead, he remained in a semi-upright position with his finger still stuck inside of that hole. And so for the next two months, his body just continued to be electrocuted every second. Finally, sometime in March, as a result of Wade's body fluids draining out of him, the electrical current that was being pumped into him altered its course and began snapping outside of his skin into the ground. And so the sound of the electrical current actually striking the ground was that popping sound that the maintenance worker heard. The door that the maintenance worker opened in order to investigate the sound was the only other door that led into the electrical vault, the other being the exterior door that Wade had gone in on. Initially, when the worker opened that door and looked inside of the vault, he actually didn't see Wade, but he smelled something funny, and that was what led him to walk into the room and make his way around, and that's when he spotted Wade's body. Earlier, on January 20th, when they found Wade's shoe, which at some point had just slipped out of the door jam, so it was not propping open the exterior door when it was found, it was just sitting in that pit area, and the exterior door was shut. And so when they found that shoe, the police, they did go inside of the electrical vault, but they didn't go in through the exterior door. They went around and went in the same door that the maintenance worker opened from right across the hall from the laundry room. 
And when they opened it up, they just looked into the room. They didn't walk into the room. They just looked from the doorway. And from their perspective, they couldn't see Wade. And so that was why initially they had said, you know, Wade is not inside of that room. Ultimately, because that exterior door to the electrical vault was supposed to be locked at all times, and clearly it was not because that's how Wade got in, Purdue was found to be negligent, and so they agreed to pay Wade's family $500,000, and they also set up a scholarship in Wade's name. Before we get into our next story, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. When I first sought out therapy to try to deal with some of my mental health issues, I remember feeling really nervous about that first interaction with the therapist. The idea of sitting in this room and pouring my heart out to this person I barely knew seemed really stressful and almost made me not want to go through with it. Now, I'm glad that I did go through with it because therapy has been an extremely important and positive thing in my life, but I wish there had just been an option option to take a phone call with my therapist to kick off the relationship. Well, with BetterHelp, that is an option because BetterHelp is an online therapy platform that offers secure phone call sessions as well as video sessions, and they have a great chat feature that allows you to message your therapist at any time. So far, the people from our strange, dark, and mysterious community who have given BetterHelp a shot have been very pleased with their experience. BetterHelp is very easy to sign up for and use. You just fill out this questionnaire that helps assess your specific needs, and then within 48 hours, you're paired up with a therapist. Then you begin to schedule your sessions with or without video. If at any time you want to change your therapist, it is free and easy to do so. So if you're struggling right now with your mental health, but you've held off starting therapy because maybe you you are intimidated about starting the process, then I would highly encourage you to make BetterHelp your starting point. And you get 10% off your first month if you go to betterhelp.com slash Mr. Ballin. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash Mr. Ballin. Okay, back to the stories. During the California Gold Rush of 1848, hundreds of thousands of Americans living on the east coast of the United States packed up their things in covered wagons and headed west for California to attempt to, quite literally, strike gold. About a year after the rush started, so in the winter of 1849, a group of about 100 would-be gold prospectors were on their way across the continental United States to California when they got lost in this totally barren stretch of desert, roughly 500 miles from their destination, which was San Francisco. They would spend the next two months driving around this desert looking for a way out, but they wouldn't find it. And so finally, they just stopped, set up camp, and waited to die. But as a last-ditch effort, they sent ahead two of their fittest men to try to go out and find help. And miraculously, those two men would find help, and it wasn't long before the lost pioneers were going up and over this mountain pass out of the desert out to safety. And so as the pioneers are cresting this mountain, one of the pioneers turns and looks down at the desert valley below where they almost all died. And he famously said, goodbye, Death Valley, and the name stuck. While Death Valley has since become a very popular tourist destination for adventurous people, it is still truly one of the harshest environments on the planet. In addition to just being a big open desert, which presents a whole host of problems to any mammal, Death Valley also becomes one of the hottest places on the planet every summer. The temperatures soar to 120 degrees Fahrenheit and sometimes get as high as 136 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the kind of place where if you don't respect it, it will kill you. In 2005, a 35-year-old man named Robert Darmer, who lived in Los Angeles, California, decided he wanted to take a trip into Death Valley. Specifically, he wanted to go to the hot springs located in the northwest corner of Death Valley. And actually, there's a nudist resort that is right around those hot springs. And so Robert wanted to go check that whole scene out. And so on July 26th of that year, Robert left Los Angeles in his Volkswagen van, and he drove north about four hours until 
he got to Bishop, California, which is a small town where some of his family lived. After spending the night with them, the next morning when Robert got up, he got back into his van and he drove south about 20 minutes to a town called Zurich, California, where he picked up Death Valley Road. This road covers the entirety of Death Valley, starting from its northern entrance, where Robert was, all the way south 140 miles to its southern entrance. And this road is actually basically a straight line. But off of this very straight road are literally hundreds of miles of unpaved roads that splinter off in all directions across the desert. And these roads bring people to other points of interest, like, for example, the nudist resort that Robert wanted to go to. So after Robert hopped onto the Death Valley Road at its northern entrance, he began driving south for about an hour, and then he began looking for the turnoff to the unpaved road that would take him the last 50 miles to the nudist resort. And so eventually, Robert believes he's found this turnoff, and so he gets onto this unpaved road, and he starts driving for a while, and then all of a sudden, his car just sinks down into the ground, and it won't budge. It would turn out Robert had made a mistake. He had not turned onto the correct unpaved road. Instead, he had picked a road that led right out onto the salt flat, and so to the naked eye, it would have looked like the ground in front of him was totally flat and hard packed, and you could easily walk on or drive on it. But in reality, the surface of the salt flat is very brittle. And underneath that brittle surface is this thick section of mud. And so before Robert could realize his mistake, he had broken through the surface layer of the salt flat and got stuck in that mud. After trying unsuccessfully to get his van back out again, Robert realized he was in a really bad situation. His cell phone had no reception, so he couldn't contact anyone, and he was too far away to attempt to walk to the nearest civilization to try to get help. But luckily, he had packed lots and lots of water that was in his van, and so he decided the only thing he could do was just sit tight at his van, ration out his water, and wait for someone on Death Valley Road to look out and see him and come to his rescue. But after waiting for six days, no one saw him. And now his water supply was dwindling, and so Robert decided his only option was to abandon his van and make the walk to civilization. And so he packed up all the water he could, he threw it on his back, and he began to walk. And just like the lost pioneers of 1849, at the very last second, Robert was rescued. As he stumbled across the desert, his canteen empty, this group of teenage boys and a few adults who were part of this group called the League of Venturers were out in Death Valley doing search and rescue training. And so they literally turned onto the same road that Robert accidentally turned onto and then got stuck on. And so they came down and found Robert. And Robert, when he saw them, he was hysterical. He was crying tears of joy. He really believed he was going to die probably that day. And so the League of Venturers, they take Robert into their van and they drive him 80 miles to the nearest ranger station. And as soon as Robert got out of the car, he dropped to his knees and he kissed the ground in appreciation. I mean, this guy really was that close to death. That evening, Robert would hitch a ride from the ranger station back to Bishop, California. And the next morning, Robert spoke with a local towing company and they agreed to drive him out into Death Valley to locate his van and tow it back out again. But when they got out there and they found his van, the towing company saw that the van was not in good shape. It had two flat tires and there were several other mechanical issues with it. And they told Robert, look, we can't tow it out until the repairs are made and we can't make those repairs right now. And so they left the van where it was and they drove Robert back to Bishop. And then when they got there, Robert, who was quite handy with his van, decided he would just make the repairs himself. And so he went around town, he gathered up all the supplies he would need. And then that evening, he got a local young couple to give him a ride back into Death Valley. Robert had told his family right before he left that his plan was to go and fix his van and then that night come back to Bishop and then the next day he would contact the towing company again and they could come out and they could get his van out. But that night, Robert did not come back to Bishop, and the next morning, when his family still had not heard from him or seen him, they contacted authorities. It would take a few days, but the authorities would eventually figure out what happened to Robert. 
the young couple that gave Robert a ride back into Death Valley, they dropped him off at this intersection right off of Death Valley Road, where they and Robert believed was only about a mile away from that nudist resort that Robert had originally wanted to go to. Robert had told the couple that his plan was just to walk from that point. He would go to that resort and he would recruit somebody else to drive him the rest of the way to the van. He could make the repairs and that person would drive him back and that would be it. So Robert got out. He said thank you to the couple and he waved to them as they drove off. And then he stashed his van supplies and then turned away from Death Valley Road and began walking along this unpaved road into the desert. However, unbeknownst to Robert or to the couple, the spot he was dropped off was the wrong spot. Spot. He was not a mile or less away from this resort. He was about 15 miles away from this resort, and the path was fairly circuitous, so even if he knew the distance, he likely would not have been able to even navigate his way there. And so after wandering down this unpaved road for about 10 miles, Robert left the unpaved road and began heading out into open desert, likely seeking water. Robert would eventually collapse and die just four days after he had been rescued from the exact same situation. When his body was found, he didn't have a GPS or a map or even a container for water. In late 2002, 25-year-old Jason Chase worked as a sheep shearer in an area called Gisborne, which is located in the northeastern section of New Zealand. When Jason wasn't working, he was often on his bike, cycling up and down the coast, preparing for his next road race. In early December of that year, Jason contacted his family, who lived in a small town called Danaverg, which is located about 200 miles southwest of Gisborne, and he told them that he wanted to come visit them for Christmas. However, he didn't know exactly when he would actually arrive at their house, because his training and work schedule were fairly hectic, but he told them, don't worry, I will be there at least on Christmas day, December 25th, or a couple of days earlier. His family was thrilled, and they said, no problem, we can't wait to see you whenever that is. And so by the time mid-December rolled around, and Jason still had not arrived at his family's home in Danaverk, his family wasn't concerned at all. However, that would soon change. On December 13th, a hunter was driving along the many winding back roads of the Ruahin mountain range. This mountain range, which is located about eight miles north of Danaverk, is a very isolated and rugged wilderness area that's full of steep gorges and gullies and very thick brush. And so as this hunter rounds the turn on this road, he looks up ahead and he sees there's a car parked on the side of the road. And so this hunter pulls up right alongside this car and he looks over and he can tell, you know, there's no one inside of it. There's no obvious damage to the car. And then the hunter began kind of scanning around the area to see if there was some obvious reason someone would stop right at that particular spot. But when he looked around, all he saw was thick trees on either side and the mountain kind of sloped down on either side. And so there was nothing unique about the spot. And so something just kind of struck the hunter as odd about this car. It just seemed totally out of place. And so operating on a hunch, the hunter would leave the mountain range and head into Danaverk, and he would contact police and he would tell them about this car and where it was located. Because in the hunter's mind, you know, maybe someone had been reported missing in the area and maybe this car is connected. And so after hearing about the car, the police did not know of any missing person cases that were connected to a car that matched the description the hunter had given. But just to be safe, the police hopped in their vehicles and they drove up into the Ruahine mountain range and they went to the spot the hunter described. And sure enough, off to the side of the road is this parked car and it's still unoccupied. After inspecting the vehicle, the police came to the same conclusion the hunter did, that there was no obvious signs of damage to the car that might have forced someone to abandon it. And then when they looked in the window at the gas gauge, they saw the gauge was full. And so the police kind of wandered around the area, kind of doing an initial search to see if maybe the owner of this car was nearby, but you know, there was no one there. They're in this very isolated part of this wilderness area. And so the police just took down the license plate of the car and they went back to their station. And when they got there, they ran the license plate number and it turned out the car belonged to Jason Chase. When Jason's family was contacted about, you know, why is Jason's car up in the Ruahine Mountains? You know, where's Jason? His family was pretty surprised 
surprised. They explained to police that Jason had made plans to come visit them around Christmas time, and so they were expecting him to come this way. And you know, the Ruahin Mountain Range, it is only eight miles away from Danaburk, so you know, in theory, maybe he stopped there on the way to their house, but they told police that just didn't make any sense. So as a precaution, the police decided to launch a search for Jason. And unfortunately, despite hundreds of people on the ground searching the Ruahine mountain range and helicopters overhead flying all over the place, no trace of Jason was found. And so the official search was called off right before Christmas, but Jason's family and friends, they continued to look for him and on January 3rd, they would find him. One of the family friends who had agreed to continue looking for Jason after the official search had shut down was a farmer who owned a plane. And on January 3rd, as he did one of his passes over the foothills of the Ruahin mountain range, he looked down and he saw this bright red thing that looked totally out of place. And the pilot couldn't tell what it was, and so he took note of its location. And then when he landed, he passed those coordinates off to the ground team. And so the ground team, they made their way over to this location, which was quite far away from where Jason's car had been. And after making their way through some very thick brush and some very steep sections, they eventually walked out to this big open clearing. It was a dry riverbed. And right in front of them, in the middle of it, was the bright red thing. It was Jason's shirt and Jason was still wearing it. He was found lying on his left side with his legs stretched out. He had on his bright red rugby t-shirt, some khaki shorts on, and he had no shoes or socks on. According to the searchers who first saw Jason in this dry creek bed, they would say the scene was very peaceful and it almost looked like Jason had lied down to fall asleep but Jason was not sleeping, he was dead. Jason had no visible injuries and there was no sign of a struggle in the area. In fact, it didn't even look like Jason had been in the wild for very long because his clothes were pristine and despite being barefoot, his feet were in great condition. Despite a lengthy search around the area where his body was discovered, his shoes and socks would not be recovered. The only thing they found in the area was a water bottle that belonged to Jason. Adding to the mystery of what happened to Jason were the results of his autopsy. The pathologist was unable to find any injuries. Jason also seemed well-nourished because he had food in his stomach and he was hydrated because there was urine in his bladder. His toxicology report also came back negative for all drugs, medications, and a range of common poisons. The only odd thing the pathologist found during the autopsy was that Jason had two very small ulcers in his duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. According to this pathologist, these type of ulcers only appear from acute stress moments before death. However, these ulcers don't indicate what caused the stress. Typically, things like severe injury or septicemia, which is blood poisoning, will cause these stress ulcers but Jason had neither of those. So at the end of the autopsy, the pathologist concluded that Jason had not been the victim of a homicide, he had not committed suicide, he had died from, quote, obscure natural causes. Interestingly though, the pathologist was able to determine with some certainty that Jason died on or around December 30th which means he was alive for the entirety of the official search for him, as well as the bulk of that private search conducted by friends and family. After the autopsy results came out, Jason's case was closed, and his family, despite having lots of unanswered questions, was forced to just move on. 15 years later, the same pathologist that had conducted Jason's autopsy was talking to a colleague about Jason's case. And as he was describing where Jason was found, Found, the colleague suddenly stopped the pathologist and said, wait a minute, I think I know what happened to him. And it would turn out he did. The following is a reconstruction of what happened to Jason Chase. On December 13th, 2002, Jason left his home in Gisborne and began heading south towards Danaverk where his family lived. But before he got to his family's home, he took a detour up into the Ruahine mountain range where he eventually parked his car on the side of the road. Once his car was stopped, he got out and collected his backpack and sleeping bag. Those were two items that were never discovered during the search or after his body was found, but it was later determined they were missing from his vehicle. 
And so after he has his pack and his sleeping bag, he also grabs a water bottle and then he leaves the main road and begins walking into the woods, making his way down the mountain. He eventually would find a spot on the side of the mountain that he liked and so he set up a campsite. What happens next is very confusing because we don't actually know why Jason actually went camping in the first place or when he intended to leave, but we can make one assumption. Whatever he was doing in the mountains, he planned on wrapping it up in time to still get to his family's house in Danaverk on or before Christmas Day, December 25th. So from December 13th, when he first got out of his car and entered the wilderness until December 25th, it's believed Jason was by choice out in the wilderness of the Ruahine mountain range. And so as this huge search is launched for him in the area he is in, it's entirely possible that he either did not see any of the searchers. This is a very rugged and heavily forested area, and so that's not totally outlandish. Or two, even if he did see the searchers, he may not have recognized that they were looking for him, because remember, during that time frame, he didn't think he was in danger. He was out in the wilderness camping by choice. But sometime around December 25th, or maybe a couple of days before, when he needed to leave and go back to Danaverk to see his family, after packing up his stuff, for whatever reason, he could not get back up to the road where his car was. Either there was some sort of physical boundary, or maybe he got lost. But either way, instead of going back up the mountain, we know Jason actually turned and began going down the mountain away from the road and away from his car. It's believed Jason actually just decided he would hike his way out of the mountains. He was in great shape, very healthy guy, and he probably figured he could just hike the eight miles to Danaverk and then he could have someone drive him back up and retrieve his car at a later date. But on or around December 30th, Jason was still out in the mountains. And at this point, he had abandoned his backpack and his sleeping bag and had most likely removed his shoes and socks for reasons we don't know. But he had managed to get much closer to Danaverk. He just had to navigate a few more steep sections and then he'd be home free. And so on or around December 30th, Jason began slowly making his way down the mountainside until he reached a decision point. He found himself standing at the top of two very steep gullies that both would bring him down to a dry stretch of riverbed, and so either option worked, it just became a matter of which one is safer. And so after making his assessment about which gully he should take, he made his choice and he made his way down and he reached the dry riverbed. And it was at this point that Jason would have begun to feel a pain in his stomach. And that pain would have gotten worse and worse and worse to the point where Jason likely sat down on this dry riverbed, kind of waiting for the pain to subside, but it wouldn't, it would only intensify. And so as he's sitting there kind of wondering what's going on, his vision would begin to blur and then he would start to struggle breathing. And before he could deal with all of these strange symptoms that were coming on really suddenly, he lost the ability to move his body and he slumped over onto his left side and there he would lay until he died. It would turn out the gully that Jason had chosen to go down when he was standing at the top and he had those two choices, the one he chose, that one contained a plant called Urtica ferrix. This plant, which is endemic to New Zealand, grows leaves that are covered in little rigid stinging hairs that contain a toxin called trifidin. And trifidin, in high enough doses, not only causes stomach pain and blurred vision and trouble breathing, but it also causes total body paralysis and even death. Jason, who according to friends, would have known about the dangers this plant posed, likely just didn't see the cluster of plants when he was assessing which gully to go down. And so it wasn't until he was partway down the gully and was in these plants that he realized his mistake, but when he turned to go back up, it was just too steep. And so he was forced to trudge through these toxic plants. And because he was wearing shorts, his lower legs were exposed and they were stung repeatedly. And so he was dealt a lethal dose. The reason the pathologist was not able to identify this as Jason's cause of death is because the stingers on those plants, they don't leave any marks on the human body. And its poison, trifidin, is so rare that when they sent out that toxicology report, they didn't include it. They did not test for trifidin. And so it wasn't until 15 years later when the pathologist's colleague heard that Jason had been found in the Ruahine Mountains that the colleague said, wait a minute, have you checked for 
or trifidin because he knew the Ruahine Mountains were home to clusters of that toxic plant. And so sure enough, they went back to where Jason's body had been found, and lining the gully that he had come down were dozens and dozens of those plants. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please pull up behind the like button at a red light and the instant the light turns green, immediately lay on your horn to speed the like button up. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly one or two video uploads. We now have a podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, which uploads brand new, never before heard podcast exclusive stories on Monday mornings. And then on Thursday mornings, we upload the remastered audio of our most popular YouTube videos. Again, it's just called the Mr. Ballin Podcast. You can Google it or you can go on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, anywhere you find your podcasts, you can find it. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username on every platform is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. We have two additional YouTube channels. One is called Mr. Ballin Shorts, where we upload random short videos and lost episodes. And the other YouTube channel is called Mr. Ballin and Espanol, and it's a Spanish language channel. We also have a Facebook page called Mr. Ballin that puts out near daily content. We also have a Snapchat channel called Mr. Ballin that puts out content on Sundays. We have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. And if you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, other YouTube channels, the podcast, wherever, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.